Hello, my name is Raj K and today I'm going to be taking you through Canon's new APS-C R-mount system cameras. I have in front of me the R10 and the R7, other way around, sorry, that's the R7 and that's the R10. Um, they're both APS-C cameras and they're probably the fastest APS-C cameras Canon have made to date. There are a couple of new RF lenses as well to go with them and in this video I'm going to be concentrating on the R7. What we're going to do is we're going to do a full um, menu walkthrough as well as go through some of the physical properties of this camera. And the reason we're not doing one on the R10 is there's quite a lot of overlap. The cameras are fairly similar in a, in a lot of ways. Before we get started though, I'll just take you through some of the key features and specs. There's plenty of information about this online, but just so we can sort of recap it uh, so you have a good idea of what the cameras can do. So the R7 is basically the spiritual successor to the EOS 7D Mark II. It is um, a super fast APS-C mount camera with a lot of the technology coming in from the top of the line uh, R3. Much in the same way the 7D Mark II had a lot of the features and spec from the 1DX. Both of these cameras are equipped with Canon's dual pixel AF2 uh, focusing technology. This is what gives Canon the edge when it comes to rapid and accurate autofocus in a great deal of tricky lighting situations um, dealing with a wide variety of subject matter. They can both shoot up to 15 frames per second with mechanical and on the R7 you are, shooting, you are able to shoot up to 30 frames per second uh, with the electronic shutter which is mind-blowingly fast, much faster than anything that's come before it. The R7 has a 32.5 megapixel sensor and the R10 has a 24 megapixel sensor. Where this really has the edge is with the image stabilization system. It's got built-in in-body image stabilization which it uses in conjunction with the lenses, much like is in the R5, R6 and the R3 now. Uh, low light focusing on the R7 is minus 5 EV, so you're really able to focus in very difficult dark lighting situations and it's able to focus with the sort of uh, F11, F22 lenses as well. So you can stick the new 600 F11 or the 800 F11, even with a two times extender on there and still get autofocus, which is really great. It's also got a pretty high ISO capability, some very good noise control, so it can cope with that um, sort of having to push up the ISO a little higher to compensate for those small apertures. It's also able to shoot in 4K uh, at 60p, as well as at full HD and 120p. So that is broadly the key features of the camera. What we're gonna do is I'm gonna go through all of the physical aspects of the camera and then I'm gonna go through the menus. And I'll also show you some of my favorite customizations for getting the best out of this camera. So grab yourself a cup of tea and let's settle in and crack on. For this video I am doing the R7, but there is quite a lot of overlap between the R7 and the R10, so a lot of what I say in this video will apply to the R10 as well, um, so you can use this video as a reference for both. And actually there's a lot of overlap with a lot of the Canon cameras because much of the menu system does stay consistent throughout Canon cameras, um, which makes them so much easier to use because when you upgrade in the future you don't have to relearn a whole menu system, a lot of it is pretty consistent throughout the series. So we'll start off with the physical, um, we'll start off with the right hand side. So most importantly on the camera, you've got your memory card slot. Um, in this camera we have two memory card slots, we have a dual SD card. They are UHS-2 compatible so you, get, you can put the higher speed cards in there. There's not much else on this side of the camera so we'll go um, to the bottom of the camera. And where we have the battery slot, you'll see the battery slot is with an LPA6NH battery. Uh, I actually only have an N battery in there, but it is compatible with the newer LP6NH batteries, which are slightly higher capacity. You'll also notice there is a standard quarter inch tripod thread, as there is on every camera. So then we we'll go over to the left hand side of the camera as you're looking through it. What we have at the top is the microphone port that allows us to put in external microphones to improve the audio. Then we have down below, we have a uh, remote release. Uh, this is a cabled remote release um, thing. You can also use the Wi-Fi system to do that. Um, then at the bottom we have a headphone port as well, so you can monitor your audio if you are using this camera for video. 
And on the back here we have um, a HDMI micro and a USB-C. The USB-C you can use to charge the uh, battery in the camera if you're not using the camera at the time. The HDMI, that allows you to use an excellent recorder but also pair up the camera with a sort of capture card and then use it for streaming as well if you would like. Onto the front of the camera we have the lens release button which is just here. Hold that and twist the lens and the lens comes off. You'll notice the shutter on this comes down to protect the sensor much like it does on the R5, R6 and R3. And then down the bottom we have something that's slightly newer on the APS-C bodies for the RF system. is a little toggle here for manual focus and autofocus. If you figure you're not going to be using the manual focus at all, much like myself, I very, very rarely use manual focus, what you can do is actually go in the menu and disable that toggle so it doesn't really do anything. In the middle of that toggle is a button that is, uh, by default, I think the depth of field preview button. You can actually um, uh, customize that to do something uh, more useful if you don't ever use depth of field preview. So now we're going with the top of the camera. On the top we have the shutter button, most important button there. Back behind that is the manual function button. The manual function button uh, by default brings up a small menu uh, to scroll through, but what you can use it, you can actually completely customize that button to do something uh, that you find more convenient. And we have a dial up there as well, which um, you use to adjust your exposure. Then we have the record button to start recording, start and stop recording video. The recording button can be customised if you use this camera primarily for stills, so you can use it to do something a little bit more convenient for yourself. The uh, button next to it is the ISO button, that's a quick shortcut to the ISO and then you use the dial to um, adjust it. And down the bottom here we have the toggle for on off and then to video mode. Um, it makes it really quick and easy to switch into video, you just flick it straight over. Next to that we have the lock button. The lock button um, toggles on or off a lock for different controls. Which controls it locks is entirely down to um, how you have that set up in the menu system. Um, it's quite convenient because you can actually tell it to turn off the touch screen and things like that, um, which does make things quite easy. And then we have the mode dial. So the mode dial there you see has a custom one, two and three, uh, bulb, manual, uh, aperture priority, uh, time priority, shutter priority, and program FV, which is a sort of flexible priority, the green one is the um, intelligent auto, scene selection mode, and then a creative mode as well. Other things we notice on the top, these little holes are microphones, they uh, capture the audio when you're doing video, and then if you want to put an external microphone on, you can do. On the top we also have a hot tube, it has a standard pin setup so that you can put on external flashes um, and uh, wireless flash transmitters. It also has, right at the top, it's very difficult to see, is a few uh, a row of pins right up the front of that hot shoe. So this is the new multifunction shoe capabilities that was featured in the R3 and the R5C, not in the R5 and the R6. And what this does is give you the capability to add um, self-powered accessories, so accessories that you don't need to put a battery in, the camera powers them. This is things like a smaller and lighter uh, wireless flash trans uh, transmitter and also microphones. So microphones that will plug into the hot shoe, you don't need to power them with an external battery and you don't have to have a cable running to your camera, which makes things a lot more convenient. Which means fewer uh, fail points, not, there's, you know, there's fewer points of failure and it means it's a lot more convenient for you. So the last thing on the top are these little anchor points there for your camera strap and then on the back of the camera we have the rest of the controls. We have a fully articulated screen, this comes out and spins around and can be closed up like that. So starting at the top we have the menu button just there, that'll take you through to the main menu of the camera and we have the viewfinder. So the viewfinder is a high resolution uh, electronic viewfinder and on the side of it just there is the diopter adjustment. So if it doesn't look sharp through the viewfinder, if you look at the text in an image uh, as you're looking through the, so if you look at the text around the outside of the viewfinder that shows you your uh, sort of exposure settings and then if it's not sharp, you can adjust the diopter to make sure that the um, viewfinder is in focus. Uh, that won't affect your image quality, it just affects how you're viewing the image through the viewfinder. And then further along the top we have the joystick that we use to move the focusing point and uh, we can navigate the menus as well. Uh, I prefer using the D-pad to get around the menus but the 
joysticks there as well. Then we have a dial around that. That allows us to change exposure settings. By default, it's generally set to the uh, aperture, but that can be customized. And then right next to that, we have the AF on button if you're using back button focus. Further along, we have the star button. That is the exposure lock. Uh, and again, that can be customized if that's not a button you use. Exposure lock, it locks the exposure if you're in an uh, automatic exposure mode um, for a predefined uh, amount of time. Um, that allows you to focus, so get an exposure from a particular area and then recompose, for example. And then below that, we have the focus um, button. So that shows the different focus groupings uh, and allows you to adjust those. Below that, we have the info button. The info button cycles through the uh, information shown on the screen if you're in shooting modes. Uh, if you're in playback, it gives you a little bit more information about the images. Below that, we have the D-pad. Um, and again, this can be customized. So uh, when you're in shooting mode, you can actually customize that to uh, more convenient shortcuts. Um, and then down below, we have the playback button and the delete button. One thing to note about the new RFS lenses is that they do fold away. So on the 18 to 45, it folds away to below the shooting uh, focal length, which makes it more compact, but it does mean you can't shoot until you turn it to 18 millimeters or onwards. And it will come up on the back screen saying um, to set the lens to the shooting position, which is what that means. Okay, so now we're gonna go through the menu system. I've got it hooked up via HDMI to a capture card and that's now recording um, what my camera sees. What we can do now is go through the Q menu. So the Q menu is in the middle of the D-pad. We hit the Q button, hit that, and it brings up this quick menu. Um, this allows us to shoot things we need quick access to. All of them will be um, exposure or shooting related. So at the top we have AF, and we can cycle through different uh, AF modes. Now, um, in the first one, spot AF is a very small area. In the next one, it's slightly larger. So the next ones we have the expanded area around, then we have flexible zone AF1, um, flexible zone AF2, which is a sort of narrow uh, portrait one, flexible zone AF3, which is a landscape one, and then the final one is the whole area AF. We do notice along these is you have an extra option. Um, so if you hit the focus mode button on the top right hand side of the camera body, um, it, as the icon shows there, you can actually expand or uh, contract these to a size that fits the sort of subject matter or the area of the focusing uh, area that you want to use. Hit OK and enable that. So they're very flexible, customizable um, modes. So one thing to note that is different about this camera to any of the other R series cameras except the R3 is that you'll notice that there's an info to enable. Um, and you what this doesn't affect is anything in one shot. So what we need to do is go down to servo um, and then come back up to the AFs and we can press info to enable it. And what that does is allow us, so if we half press the shutter button to focus, at the moment it's continually focusing but only focusing on those squares that we uh, allow it to focus on. If we hit the info, oops, if we hit um, the Q button and press info to enable that, what we're doing is allowing the camera to track the subject we've selected across the frame. Now you can imagine if you're trying to focus on a small bird in a busy uh, environment like you know in the bushes, we can go down to a small area, pick where that um, focus point is, pick our subject, half press the shutter button and then it's going to track that subject across the frame. Um, and if it takes flight, then it will continue to track that subject. It also means that if you've got multiple subjects, it allows you to pick the subject within those that you want to focus on. Makes this focusing system much easier to use. And uh, it is something that you can set up on uh, the R5 and R6. It's just the initial survey AF point. Have a look at my other videos on the R5 and R6 for that tip. Then going down, we have the image quality settings we can set up to um, JPEG and RAW, or just JPEG, or just RAW. Um, then we have the drive mode, so this is in single shot. We can go to high speed continuous plus, which is super fast. And uh, particularly in the uh, electronic shutter mode, this allows you to shoot at extremely high frame rates, 30 frames a second. 
high speed continuous is a little bit slower, low speed continuous brings it right down, and then we have self timer of 10 seconds remote. Um, so this enables the uh, remote trigger, Bluetooth trigger, um, if you have that, and the two seconds remote, so you can have a two second timer or uh, use the remote. And you can actually set up a continuous um, timer as well. So what it does is it'll count down to the end of your time and take a number of shots after that. So if we hit info here, oops, hit info, we can say that it's gonna do nine shots. So it gives you however long you've set the camera up to do in the menu um, to leave you. And then at the end of that time, it will take nine pictures. Below that, we have a metering mode that allows you to set where the camera is looking in the frame for its metering. Um, this won't be affected if you're in manual mode. So you've got partial metering, spot metering, or center weighted average. Evaluative means kind of takes into account most of the uh, uh, frame. Then we have the back button. Anti-flicker shoot is a flicker detection system. So I'll go into this a little bit later in the menu because it will come up there as well. Below that is your white balance. You can cycle through your different white balance options. Um, and set a Kelvin value if you like, and set up a custom um, white balance. You also have the option to go in here to set white balance ambient priority or white priority. This allows it to take into account either the sort of um, ambient light, the warmth of the ambient light, or whites are actually white. And that is down to personal preference. And then we have picture styles. I'll go into this a bit later as well, but this just changes the uh, sort of processing of the imagery that comes out of your camera um, to a look that suits the subject matter. Um, I tend to have this on um, sort of neutral or faithful, and you can also set up custom ones as well. Creative filters, so this is um, something you can go into and just set up different filters as well. There's a, lots of interesting ones here. And subject to detect. So with the autofocus tracking system, um, it is designed to pick out subjects like people, uh, animals, and uh, by animals I mean birds, cats and dogs at this stage, and also uh, motor racing cars. And we're talking racing cars and sort of motorbikes, that sort of thing. Um, it won't ignore people if you have it on racing cars, for example, um, but it will prioritize one over the other if you're in a particular mode. So um, you have people, animals and um, vehicles. Spot detection, you can hit info to enable or disable it picking out the driver. So spot is the driver in this, where it says spot detection. I don't know why the driver's called spot. There you go. Um, and then you can have off. So no priority, it just picks out whatever it can see. I tend to have that on people because I'm a portrait photographer. All right, so now we're going to the deep dive into the menu system. So we'll hit the menu and we'll cycle over to number one. So the camera menu. First one is image quality. We can go in there, set up uh, JPEG or HEF or RAW. Um, so JPEG HEF, you can't change to HEF in this menu. Uh, I'll show you where to do that a little bit later. Um, you can either shoot JPEG or HEF, not both at the same time, and you can do either one of those with RAW. So below that is dual pixel RAW. Uh, dual pixel RAW is different to dual pixel AF. DualPixel AF is the autofocus system that Canon uses, but that autofocus system allows us to get more detail, if we like, from our RAW files. So DualPixel RAW takes all of that information when the image is captured and allows you a little bit more flexibility in your editing. Now, uh, you can only do this in, dual, in Canon's own uh, editing software, the Digital Photo Professional, which is free if you've got one of Canon cameras. Um, you can download that from the Canon website. And this allows you to um, affect things like changing the point of optical sharpness, getting uh, reducing ghosting and flare, and um, a few other things. It is useful. It does um, take up more memory, so the image file for file sizes will be about double. Um, but it's there and something to look into if you uh, want to have a little bit more image quality. So still image aspect ratio. Uh, you can change the aspect ratio and it will show that in the viewfinder as well to show you a little bit of, uh, make it easier to compose for your output. 3 by 2 is the standard. Camera menu 2, exposure compensation and exposure bracketing. So here we have, uh, you can exposure compensation. So if you think the automatic exposure on the camera is too dark, bright or dark, you can kind of increase it or decrease it. Um, there is a quicker way of getting to this. You use the... Uh, 
manual function button and scroll across when you're shooting. If you use the dial, it'll go across and have uh, bracketing. So what it'll do is take one picture below, one picture at the correct exposure and one picture overexposed. And you can combine that, for example, for HDR purposes. Um, I'm going to get rid of, oops, get rid of that. ISO speed settings, we can go in and set the ISO. So at the moment it's on auto, we can set the ISO there. Much quicker ways of doing that. We can actually adjust the range though. So um, this allows us to increase or decrease the range. So H, H uh, allows it to sort of artificially go to a higher ISO and boost the, the noise, uh, boost the uh, sort of sensitivity, but it does increase your noise levels. Um, this, uh, and then the auto range also uh, allows you to adjust how far the automatic exposure is allowed to push the ISO. Um, so you can adjust that there. And here you can set your uh, minimum shutter speed. So the minimum shutter speed is um, how slow the shutter speed can go. And if you think you can't handhold as much as someone else, perhaps you might want to um, make the minimum shutter speed a little bit faster. Now this is slightly offset by the image stabilization system built into the camera, so you should be able to handhold for um, longer than you would have done before. HDR shooting mode. Um, so this is different to multiple exposures and combine them to HDR. This is HDR PQ. If we enable that, and go back over to image quality, you'll notice we are now shooting, well, you can't see it there, but we are now shooting in HEF. So um, the JPEGs are not capable of shoot, showing um, HDR PQ. HEF uh, has a lot more information um, in a smaller file and it allows it to show you um, proper HDR. Below that is HDR mode. So HDR mode is the multiple exposure and combining them version of HDR. So we can go in there, enable that, so we can do plus or minus one, two or three EV. So this is sort of uh, how many stops below and above that it's gonna combine. Um, continuous, this is how many times it's gonna do that combination. So if you have it on one shot only, it'll do one HDR and then revert to normal shooting again. And then auto image align aligns those images. So if you're not shooting on a tripod, um, and you're hand holding, it'll align those images and crop out the excess. And then you can save the source image. Um, so just the final image that it's combined or also all the original files as well, if you want to do it again in Photoshop. So also lighting mode optimizers below that. Uh, in manual or bulb modes, this is disabled by default. Um, when you're in any of the automatic exposures, what this does is allow the camera to compensate for the person or a subject uh, in the frame. So if it recognizes a person, it will increase the brightness on their face. Highlight tone priority protects the highlights. So if there's a blown out area, um, it'll try and adjust the exposure so that they are protected. And then down at the bottom, anti-flicker shoot. This is what I mentioned earlier. So anti-flicker shoot is a way of dealing with indoor lighting. Um, so where there's uh, artificial light sources, they flicker generally, so um, your light bulbs in your house tend to flicker, and that's flickering with the frequency of electricity. So what this does is it detects that, and in uh, burst mode, it will slow down your burst mode a little bit, so you're not gonna hit the same frame rate, but it will do is it'll hit the uh, shutter effectively at the peak of that wave. So every time you get the consistent lighting um, at the brightest point that the lights are gonna be. Um, menu three. External speed light control, when you have external speed lights, this allows you to uh, adjust um, settings within the speed lights. You can adjust the ETTL uh, metering, so the metering can actually prioritize faces, um, or you can have it evaluative or average. This is fairly a uh, new system, ETTL2. Um, and you can go right in and actually adjust particular settings within the flashes. I don't have a flash, um, with me at the moment, so I'm gonna not do that. Metering mode down the below, um, as I said, you can actually get to this much quicker using the Q menu. Uh, down below is white balance, I've already shown you that on the Q menu. And down below is custom white balance. You can actually pick an image um, that you've already taken, set a white balance based off that image to apply to your image that you'll be subsequently shooting. This is very useful if you've got a gray card or a white piece of paper, for example, take a picture of that, set the white balance based off that, 
and then you can shoot onwards. Right balance shift, this allows you to shift the colors slightly one way or the other. Uh, most of this is really only affected greatly by um, shooting in RAW, if you shoot, sorry, in JPEG. If you're shooting in RAW, a lot of this can be adjusted afterwards. Down below is color space, um, so sRGB or Adobe RGB, um, which one you shoot in is entirely up to you uh, and really depends on the output of your images. If your output is mostly for web, and like nine, myself, 99% of what I do is going to web, I leave it in sRGB. The, in, the, the internet kind of works in sRGB. Maybe one day it'll change, but at the moment it works in sRGB. So uh, I shoot in that color space, I edit in that color space, and then I output in that color space, and that means that what I see is probably what I'm gonna get on most people's devices. And it just reduces the chances of um, any particular browser deciding to try and reduce Adobe color down to sRGB, which is a smaller color space, um, and getting it slightly wrong. So by having it consistent, I, I'm in more control of that. If you shoot in R, uh, sRGB and you wanna have it in Adobe RGB, if you're shooting RAW, the information is still there and you can change that in Photoshop. Picture style, um, so this is uh, sort of adjusting the processing of the image. Again, this is only affected if you're shooting in JPEG or HEF, not in RAW. In RAW, it will be red if you bring it into um, Canon software. Adobe tends to ignore this. Um, but what it allows you to do is, so portraits kind of a bit more flatter on skin tones, landscapes would boost the greens a little bit, things like that. Um, and clarity, so again, uh, this is something that comes with uh, Canon's Dual Pixel AF system. This allows you to uh, increase the clarity and that sort of micro contrast um, in the image. It's like having the clarity slider in Photoshop in camera. So if you're shooting JPEG and, and HEF and you want it to be a little bit more sort of crisper, you can increase the clarity. And down below, shooting creative filters, I've shown you that in the Q menu. Okay, camera menu five. So lens aberration correction, you go in here. Uh, what this does is it'll show you what lens you have on the camera and the corrections the camera is doing for that lens. No lens in existence is perfect. So uh, what Canon have done is calculated and actually tested uh, and given you the values for the best corrections available for your lens and camera combination. And with the RF lenses, all of that data is stored in the lens and the camera's reading that. Um, it allows you to set up digital lens optimizer. You can increase or decrease how much it's um, compensating for imperfections in the lens and peripheral illumination correction. That's the vignetting it's dealing with. And in some lenses, you can actually set up distortion correction as well. So that sort of corrects for pincushion distortion and, and things like that. Um, long exposure noise reduction. Um, if you're doing long exposures, the sensor tends to warm up um, and that kind of introduces more noise. So you can actually increase your uh, noise reduction for long exposures. And again, for higher ISO, obviously as you go up ISO, you increase noise, so you can increase your noise reduction there as well. Dust delete, delete data, you can actually set up um, a, an image to pick out dust spots and then the camera automatically removes those. Uh, it's a little bit complicated to set up, so just refer to the manual to do so. Okay, camera menu six, uh, multiple exposure. Also, exposure is a creative effect. Um, we've kind of covered this before, but uh, you can enable that. Set the type of exposure combination, so it's additive, oops, um, average, bright, or dark. You can experiment with those. And then how many exposures you're gonna do. Um, and you can actually start with an image you've already taken as well, so you can pick an image on your uh, memory card to start your multiple exposure. Uh, continuous multiple exposure there is just how many times it does this, runs through it. If you have it on one, then it does the multiple exposure and reverts to normal shooting afterwards. Uh, oops, disable that. The next one we have here is raw burst mode. We can go in here and enable that. So this is a new feature. So raw burst mode is shooting at high frame rate raws, and you can go in and extract your particular image that you want out of it afterwards. But it has this nifty thing that it is actually able to um, start shooting before you've hit the shutter button. So it's continually shooting and discarding images uh, while you half press the shutter button. And it starts taking photos and then when you've taken the picture, it stores half a second um, prior to your first image. 
uh, or for, sorry, half a second prior to you hitting the shutter button. Which means if you um, are waiting for something to happen and you just miss it, it will have it stored and you're able to go back and actually uh, find that photo. Which is pretty amazing. Below that is focus bracketing. So this is something that was on the RP. Um, the camera is able to take multiple images uh, at different distances. So what it does, it will focus on a particular subject here and then you can say um, set the focus increment and how many photos it's going to take and it will then take photos all the way through at different focus distances. This is great for macro work, um, it's a really really popular feature of macro work and you can also be used for landscape photography and things like that as well. Okay, camera menu 7. So drive mode, I've shown you that in the quick menu uh, part of the video. Interval timer, so this allows you to set up uh, the camera to take pictures automatically at set intervals and you can set how many photos and the interval in between each picture. It's a little bit like time lapse but um, you're keeping all individual frames up full quality. Below that is bulb timer, you need to put the camera into bulb mode for this to work and then bulb timer what that does is allow you to take shutter speeds over 30 seconds. The camera in manual mode only allows you to go up to 30 seconds maximum. Below that is silent shutter function so we can go in here and turn that on and that makes the camera completely silent. It's using the electronic shutter and making no noise whatsoever. Um, the difference between this and the electronic shutter in the next bit of the menu is that in this mode it actually makes an artificial sound to give you a bit of audible feedback that you are in fact taking photos. Um, in silent shutter mode it has a little white box that appears around the frame as we take, every time it takes a photo. So shutter modes, mechanical, electronic, first cut, and then electronic. The only reason you wouldn't use um, electronic in certain modes is that you can't use flash with it. It does give you the full speed of the camera um, at 30 frames a second. But also when you're photographing very fast moving subjects, say if they're going across the frame, uh, it can introduce a level of distortion, uh, what's called rolling, a sh rolling shutter. Um, electronic and mechanical, there's not a lot of difference really. You can use electronic for most things. If you're in extreme situations where you're still introducing rolling shutter or um, yeah that's pretty much the only thing that can go wrong the mechanical can still be uh, better but I tend to use it in electronic first curtain you can use flash in electronic first curtain and in mechanical next one is release shutter without card uh, you should have that off because one day you'll pick up the camera and the camera will let you take pictures and you won't have a card in it and it'll be really annoying um, camera menu 8 Image stabilization mode, uh, so this will not appear in the menu if your lens has a switch for your IS, um, but this allows you to um, have the IS on or off, and that's in the lens and in the body. And then below is digital IS for video, so in video mode it can crop into the video and, and create a bit of a, a digital image stabilization which gives you more IS. Next one is auto level, this is a brand new feature uh, in the R7. What this does is uses the IS system to keep your horizons level in between shots. So um, if you're taking a row of burst images, for example, it'll try and keep that horizon completely level, even as you slightly tilt off. Um, it can only go so far, of course, but that's a new feature, which is pretty interesting. Next one is customize quick controls. Uh, the quick control menu that I showed you, you can actually customize and, and decide which uh, options are available to you. Below that is touch shutter. Um, so on the touch screen, when you're seeing the image on the back, you can touch the shutter to take a picture. It's useful if you're in a tricky, uh, tricky angle, like right, really low down, and you you can't quite reach the shutter button or whatever. Image review: when you've taken a picture, how long it stays on the back screen, and whether it comes up in the viewfinder as well. Uh, I tend to have that off. You can press play and then still look through the viewfinder, and it will show you it. But this is just when it automatically shows the image after you've taken it. High speed display, if you're in uh, high speed continuous shooting mode, you can enable this. This uh, allows the viewfinder to keep up a little bit better with fast moving subjects uh, and your high frame rate. Metering timer is how long it, the camera keeps the metering once it's sort of set the exposure. Camera menu nine, display simulation. Um, so this is like the exposure simulation in previous cameras in the menu but it goes a little bit more in depth. So um, say if you don't want, what happens with these cameras is as you change the exposure, it shows you what that exposure is gonna be. You can turn that off. If you want it to behave more like a digital SLR, you can actually turn that off. 
but you can also have the camera show you the exposure as well as the what the depth of field will look like um, instead of having to press the depth of field preview button or you can have it just when it tails uh, on the depth of field preview button next one is Optical Viewfinder Simulation Assist, uh, View Assist. So the viewfinder is obviously an um, electronic viewfinder, but you can make it look like an optical viewfinder by enabling this setting. What this will mean is that what you see isn't what you get at the moment. What you see is uh, in the viewfinder is pretty much what it'll look like. But this gives you a more natural look and feel. Uh, shooting info display, you can actually toggle how much information and what information is shown in the viewfinder. Um, and um, and one that's useful in here is you can go to brightness histogram um, and actually change that to an RGB histogram so that you, you get a three channel uh, histogram which gives you a bit more information. And oh, you can actually set up your lens information display or distance of uh, focus as well in here, which is quite useful. Um, you can reverse the display there, uh, viewfinder display format. You can crop in a little bit if you're finding it difficult to see the whole screen in there. And display performance, you can actually have this on a smoother, uh, higher frame rate in the viewfinder. Now, um, you'd, the trade-off here is that it use more power. Um, so power saving is better for most situations, unless you're moving, shooting fast moving subjects. Camera menu 10, moving recording size. So here we can set up the resolution and frame rate of our videos. Um, we have 4K or Full HD, and down below 25p or 50p, or frames per second if you like. And then down below is the compression rate. Uh, on this camera we have IPB only, um, which is a sort of compressed uh, video format. Below that is uh, the sound recording, whether it's using automatically level, automatically adjusting the levels so that um, you know the, the sort of volume of the uh, microphone is set automatically, or you can set it all manually as well and you can uh, limit the high ISO for video there. You can also um, change how the video behaves automatically in low light, um, how it adjusts for uh, sort of the darkness. So whether you have a brighter image but a slower frame rate, um, a slower shutter speed, or you have a smoother moving subject uh, but a slightly darker image. Down below is auto levels, um, so this is the auto leveling feature to kind of keep your horizon flat, but also in video mode, which is really clever. Shutter button function movies, this uh, uh, allows you to customise what the shutter button um, is doing when you're shooting videos. Next one is AF modes, um, so AF menu 1, AF operation and server are one shot, I showed you in the quick menu. You want servo if you're tracking moving subjects. And actually I find um, for shooting portraiture, even though the subject isn't necessarily moving very quickly, uh, with very shallow depth of field, you kind of still want it in servo, so it's tracking the eye um, and making sure that eye is perfectly in, in focus. AF areas, I showed you that in the Q menu. And then subject is to track. To track uh, this is the, what I showed you in the Q menu is the info button, whether it's doing subject tracking or not. And then the type of subject here, um, obviously, it, as I said, it doesn't, um, Ignore subjects if you're in uh, people, it doesn't ignore vehicles, it just prioritizes people. Um, and that's what it's doing. And then in vehicles, you can enable or disable spot detection, which is enabling or disabling picking out the driver. Eye detection uh, whether or not the camera is in, in any of those modes, picking out the eye of the subject. Um, I tend to have that on enable. And then how readily the camera is going to switch subjects. So if I have um, a crowd of people and I want the camera to pick up one person and stay with that person, I want that on a very low uh, level there, so it stays on that subject. If I want it to switch as people come in and out, I would have that on higher. Okay, AF menu two. So here we have the case studies, the um, different cases for different types of subject matter. So if you are photographing subjects that are moving very predictably, um, you want it set up slightly differently to how they would be if it was moving very erratically. Now to give you an idea, tracking sensitivity of the two sort of variables here, uh, there's tracking sensitivity and acceleration and deceleration tracking. Uh, tracking sensitivity, what that does is as the subject is panning, going across you, for example, and you're panning with it, um, you're sort of moving with that subject, and a tree comes between you and that subject, um, 
what you want is the camera to ignore the tree. But if the tracking sensitivity is on quite high, it's going to hit the tree, focus on that, and then try and refocus on the subject as it comes out from behind it. Um, so what we do is we add a little bit of a delay. So tracking sensitivity on slightly lower has a bit of a delay to uh, the camera reacting to big changes in depth of field, uh, or depth of focus. What this doesn't do is change the speed of initial pickup. So the initial pickup of the subject is the same regardless of you have, whether you have this on really high or really low. If the subject is coming directly towards you, that's a continuous change of distance of focus. So you want the tracker sensitivity on really high. The one below that, acceleration deceleration tracking, this is a way of telling the camera how the subject's going to behave. If it's going to move erratically, uh, if it's going to suddenly start moving from a, a still position, it just gets the camera ready to move. Um, and so having that on higher or lower will depend on the subject you're shooting. What I tend to recommend is use the cases as they are for uh, initially, and then what you can do is actually go in and individually affect each one and um, increase or decrease the individual variables. There is also an auto at the bottom. Now this will only affect you if you are shooting in servo and tracking a moving subject. If it's a still subject, it won't matter. AF menu three, one shot AF release priority, whether it is the priority is to make sure it's in focus or to take a picture. Um, so I'll leave that on focus. Preview AF, I actually don't know what this does. I need to double check and leave it in the comments. Uh, lens drive when AF is impossible. Um, so if the camera struggles to find focus, does it continue to search or does it just stop the search? AF assist beam firing, so at the top here you have a little AF assist beam. Uh, lamp and what that does is fire off a, a light and uses that to help focus. I tend to have that off because of the event uh, sort of photography I do in events and um, things like that can be a little bit distracting. Okay so the next one AF4 um, we have touch and drag AF settings so we can go in here and enable this and what this does is when the camera is up to your eye um, you can use your thumb on the touch screen um, to move the focusing point. This is in conjunction with the joystick if you want, or instead of the joystick, it's up to you. So I tend to have that on the right-hand side because I'm a right-eye shooter, it just makes more sense. Uh, or you can have it on the left-hand side. And most importantly, you want that in relative, not absolute. Um, so limit AF areas, you can reduce the number of these that show up in the menu uh, just to make it quicker to switch between them. And then below that, the sensitivity for AF point select, you can increase the sensitivity or decrease it. Just makes it quicker to move the point around. And below that, orientation linked AF point. So uh, what this does is when you're in portrait, it'll, and you move the focus point around, it will remember where it was. And then when you go into landscape and you move the focus point around, it'll remember where that was. So you can switch between them really quickly. Uh, it does make it a little bit easier. The next one is AF5, uh, manual focus peaking settings. We can turn this on or off. Uh, when you're in manual focus, it um, allows you to see which areas are sharp and in focus by giving you a little bit of a halo around them in a different in a color of your choosing. And then below that is focus guide. Um, this uses the dual pixel AF system to um, give you a sort of a guide, whether you're front or back focusing, and then it'll tell you when you're in focus. So as soon as I hit focus, it goes green. Uh, there we go, like that. Um, below that is movie servo AF. When you're in uh, video mode, is it continually focusing or not? The next one is camera, oh. next one is AF menu six. So electronic full-time manual focus. This is for lenses that have an electronic focusing ring. You can have it always ready to allow you to take over for manual focus, overriding the autofocus, or just have that disabled. I tend to have that disabled so I don't knock it. Uh, below that is lens electronic manual focus. Um, you can, once you do override it, how long it stays um, on manual focus. Focus and control ring. Um, so on some lenses like the new RFS lenses, there is a ring at the front. And if you don't use it for focus, for manual focus, you can actually use it as a control ring to adjust um, exposure related, generally exposure related um, things. You can 
switch that here. So uh, change that from focus to control. And then in the custom control area, which I'll show you later, you can actually adjust what that uh, um, control ring controls. So the next one is focus ring rotation. You can change this to uh, adjust things the opposite way, if you like. And then RF um, lens manual focus ring sensitivity, how sensitive the ring is to you turning it, to how much it changes the focus. So if you want a very, very um, accurate manual focus, you can actually reduce the sensitivity here. Okay, so now we're in playback, playback menu one. So you can protect images, uh, that allows you to protect a range of images or individual images from being deleted. Uh, the next one is arrays images, so then you can delete images, but you can indiv delete individual images or whole ranges of them. Um, you can rotate uh, images in the camera and rotate movie rotation info. You can change uh, movie rotation info. What this does is allow you to change a uh, movie from landscape to portrait. It won't show that in camera, but it will show that on the computer. So when you bring it into uh, edit, it will show as a portrait video, which you can use for social media, etc. Um, you can actually set ratings for individual images on the card, which then show up in the metadata. So it's a good way of uh, marking images um, for ones you like or dislike um, for review later. And because you've got two uh, memory card slots on this camera, you can actually copy the images from one card to another. Um, which I find quite useful for backing up on the go. Next one is camera menu two. Um, you can actually set up the order for prints and uh, photo book setups on here as well. I don't know why you do this in camera, it's much easier to do it on um, the computer. Next one is playback menu three. You can actually go in here and um, uh, process your RAWs uh, and you can adjust your exposure settings slightly, um, make changes, crop images as well, and then export them as a JPEG or a HEF. Um, below is Creative Assist, you can actually add um, sort of creative filters and effects to images from here. And then in down below, when you're in the playback menu, you have the quick control button, uh, what that shortcut is to, whether it's raw processing or uh, Creative Assist. When you have the camera connected up to Wi-Fi, you can actually um, use a cloud-based raw image uh, processing system. So it doesn't use the processing power in the camera, it uses a, uh, a cloud-based system, um, which you need to set up with Wi-Fi. Uh, and it's a whole new system which is very clever. Below that is creative filters. You can actually add creative filters to images you've already taken and you can resize your images as well. And then in playback menu four, you can actually um, crop your images and then below you can convert from HEF format to JPEGs. So if you have a compatibility issue, you can um, always do that in camera. Playback menu five, so slideshow, you can connect the camera up via the HDMI cable straight to a TV and then set up a slideshow to uh, have your images play back. Um, you can search for individual images for that. So if you've um, rated individual images, you can go by that or protected images. Um, whether when you press the playback button, it shows you what you last saw or not. Um, and then magnification, you can actually in here set what the magnify button does. So next to the button, sort of focus mode button at the right hand side of the camera, there's a magnify. So when you're in playback, if you hit that, it'll magnify into the image. Um, at the, by default, it's set up to two times magnification. But what I tend to do is actual size and then from focus point. So then when you hit that button, it immediately goes to where you've tried to focus and at full magnification. So you can double check very quickly whether it's sharp. And then on the top wheel, how many images that jumps when you scroll through that. Um, playback menu six, playback information display, um, how much information is shown in the playback display. Highlight alert, so this flashes any areas that are close to or are burnt out. And then AF point display, so it will show a red dot where it um, should be in focus, where your AF point was. Playback grid, it shows you a grid over, overlay of your uh, on the top of your images to give you an idea for compositions. And then movie playback uh, play count, it shows you uh, the record time or uh, time code if you have time code set up. And then HDMI, HDR output. So when you're playing back, whether you're outputting HDR content to your TV. So next menu is the Wi-Fi and uh, connectivity 
menu. So we have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth connection. We can enable that here. So we can uh, set to connect to smartphone. You can connect this up to an app, um, the Camera Connect app, uh, which allows you complete remote control of the camera uh, from your phone. And then the next one is remote, remote control EOS utility. You can do this cabled or wirelessly. On this one, in this case, we're looking at wirelessly. And this is what I have set up now on the camera that's filming me. So I'm able to see on my laptop that's down here, not only what this is seeing, because I can't see on the back screen, but I can also see what that's seeing as well. Um, it's really useful for uh, creating video content, but also um, for sort of a lot of environments where you're shooting stills. And the next one, you can actually print directly to a Wi-Fi printer using this function, upload your images to image.canon using a cloud-based system, and then uh, you can also set up connecting to a wireless remote. Below that is airplane mode. If you want to turn off all radio um, sort of wireless connections, you can do that there. And you can disable or enable Wi-Fi from here. Show your connection history, send to smartphone after shot. So every, every image, you can have it send an image straight to your smartphone. Um, obviously, if you're shooting in full high resolution, it can be a little bit slow. So I tend to have that off. Next, we have Bluetooth settings. So we can go in here and enable Bluetooth and use uh, a, an always on connection to your mobile phone, for example. And what this allow, enables you to do is uh, take your phone out your pocket and review images on the camera without taking the camera out of your bag, which is really useful when you're out and about. Um, below that, you can set up the name for your camera. So you've got multiple cameras, you can actually name each one individually. And then GPS device settings, so you can hook the camera up to your phone and then use your phone's GPS uh, readings to apply that to the metadata in your images, which is really nice. Uh, simple way of kind of getting around not having GPS built into each of the cameras. So moving across the yellow menu, the spanner menu, um, menu one, record function card and folder select. You can go in here and record uh, and set up how the camera records things to each of the cards. So if you've got multiple cards, you can have one have um, images and one have video, for example, or have raw on one and um, JPEG on another and set up which card it's recording to. You can also go down the bottom and actually set up a new folder, which I find quite useful. So if you go in between different shoots or different um, areas of the day, you can actually set up a different folder for each thing. It does make things uh, a little bit easier for organization when you come back home. File numbering, continuous or auto reset every time you put a new card in. Um, down the bottom file name, you can actually change your file name so it has your initials, for example. Next one is format card. You can go in here and uh, erase everything on the card. Also rotate, um, so whether the images are rotated on the back screen of your camera. Some people don't like to have this off and just have it on, on the computer because that way it shows um, using a larger portion of the screen. Um, it kind of makes sense. The uh, add video rotation information, um, you can choose to have this off because obviously if you're shooting a shot that is going to be presented landscape but your camera's off at an angle, um, you don't want that rotation information causing the video to rotate when it comes into your editing software. And then down the bottom you can set up your time and date. Next one is span the menu two. You can set up your language, um, your video system for PAL or NTSC. NTSC is the American system, and this allows you to shoot at 30 frames a second and 60 frames a second instead of 25 and 50. Um, help, mo help text size, so you can actually increase the size of your uh, help text if, you're, if you find things difficult to read. And then your mode guide, you can actually um, enable or disable the information it gives you for each mode. Uh, up the top here in Spanner Menu 3, you can turn the beep on and off. I tend to have this off, so this is particularly uh, when you use the touch screen, it beeps, but also when you hit focus in um, one shot, it beeps. And you can change the volume. Headphones, you can change the headphone volume in here. And down the bottom is power saving um, settings, so you can have the screen turn off automatically after a certain amount of time. Um, or just dim to save power as well if you're not actively using it. Okay, so next is Spanner Menu 4. 
In here we have screen view finder display so that this enables you to go in and set up the switching between the viewfinder or the back screen. Uh, by default it's on auto one. What this does is when the screen is flipped out like that, it disables the proximity sensor on the viewfinder because the assumption here is that if it's out, it's more likely you're going to be doing um, you're, you're going to be using the screen and not wanting to use the viewfinder. So particularly if you're doing video, that way um, it doesn't switch to the viewfinder and turn off that back screen when you're when you get too close to your chest or cl too close to a uh, gimbal, for example. Auto switching two is it always switches even when the screen's out, and then down below you can manually switch between viewfinder and screen. And you can actually set up a custom button to switch between the viewfinder and the screen if you want to do it manually. Screen brightness, self-explanatory. Viewfinder brightness, so that's the one in the viewfinder, you can set up the brightness in there. Next one is screen and viewfinder color tone. You can, this is sort of affecting both the screen and the viewfinder um, and the, the, the sort of display of those images. And below you can actually fine tune that. Uh, for the viewfinder, because what can happen sometimes is the viewfinder is slightly looks slightly different to the screen. So to keep them consistent, you can go in and fine tune them. You uh, user interface magnification. You can enable that, and then when you double tap on the touch screen or any part of the menu, it'll magnify in for you to make it a little bit easier to read. And then down below, HDMI resolution. So this is the output resolution of the HDMI. Um, Next one over, touch control, standard sensitive or disable. If you're wearing gloves, you might want this on uh, sensitive. And then the multifunction lock, so that's the lock button at the top of the camera here. Um, you might want to customize that to uh, affect different things, so you can do that in here. And then below that is the um, manual focus, autofocus switch, and you can enable or disable that. The, um, you can also disable or enable the shutter closing at shutdown um, to protect the sensor. And then below that is the sense cleaning, whether it does that every time the camera is turned off uh, and you can manually uh, tell it to do so now. And below that is the Choose USB Connection app. So when you connect via USB directly to uh, a phone, for example, or straight to a computer, uh, you can um, tell it what you're connecting to. So, Spanner menu six, you can reset the camera. You can go in for basic settings. Um, if anything goes wrong and you can't quite remember what you've changed, for example, just go in here, reset everything. It's not going to delete your images uh, and it will take it back to factory. So basic settings doesn't reset everything. It resets kind of uh, simple things like your exposures and, and, and that sort of stuff. Um, other settings you want to go in, you can, all your customizable stuff is in here. It can reset all of those in one spot. Custom shooting modes, um, so you can set up your image uh, exposure and everything you, the way you want it set up, and then go in here and save and register those settings. Down below is auto update set, so um, whether or not, basically if you're in custom one, for example, and you, turn the, and you change some settings, turn the camera off and turn it back on again, it'll revert back to what those settings were when it started, um, and w when you first set it up like that. If you have an auto update, if you change the settings in custom one and turn the camera off, it'll save what you've just changed it to. Um, so depending on how you work, uh, you might want that on. It'll give you sort of health of your battery and what type of battery you've got in there. And then copyright information below that, you can input your copyright information and that is stored in the metadata of your photos um, when it's on the computer. So you can see in the metadata that it's your image. It gives you some layer of copyright protection. This gives you a QR code to the manual, and then below that is certification logo soft display. Uh, it's just some things it has to have. And then below that is firmware versions, so you can go in and update the firmware from here. Okay, so the next menu is the customization menu. So uh, custom menu one, exposure level increments. Um, you can actually change this to half stop, so if you want to increase your exposures much quicker, you can do that. ISO speed setting instruments, similar thing. So the next one, speed for metering ISO auto. When the ISO is on automatic in any um, shooting mode really, it uh, after the metering timer ends, does it revert back to auto or does it stay on that ISO? So the next one is bracketing auto cancel. So if you are midway through a bracketing sequence, 
if you turn the camera off, does it just wipe that and start from uh, back to normal shooting afterwards when you turn it back on? Bracketing sequence, um, whether it shoots the correct exposure first and then low and high, basically the order in which it does the images. The number of bracketed shots, you can actually set up to seven different shots, so um, three below, one correct, and three above. So the last one here is safety shift. So what this does is in aperture priority and shutter priority, it allows the camera to make sure that the image is within a usable kind of exposure, not too underexposed, not too overexposed, even if your settings are kind of limiting what it's allowed to do. Next one, uh, custom menu two, same exposure for new aperture. When you change lenses uh, and the aperture, maximum aperture changes, um, does it adjust the exposure to compensate? Below that is the auto exposure lock in different metering modes after focus. So depending on the type of metering mode you have, when you half press the shutter button, it will lock the exposure at that point and you can set which metering modes um, do that. Below that, set shutter speed range. Um, you can sort of reduce or increase your shutter speed, maximum shutter speed range. You'll notice down here, um, the electronic shutter is actually able to shoot at 16 thousandth of a second. Um, which is much faster than any traditional digital SLR. Below that, set aperture range, so we can um, increase or decrease the maximum aperture range. Obviously that's going to be limited by your lenses. So here we can change the direction of the dials for changing the aperture or the shutter speed, and then below the ring, so this will be the one on the lens. The next one here is you can switch the functionality from that one and that dial, so just switches them over. Below that is customized buttons. So this is really a part of the menu that's really worth having a little uh, delve into. You can go in here and set up your custom controls from uh, stills and for video. And there's a few things I like to do in here. Um, there are a few useful ones uh, for the first time, I think ever on a Canon camera by default direct AF point selection is on on this joystick, so you don't have to press a button and then move the, the focusing point. And then if you press info on that, you can actually decide what it does when you press in that joystick. Um, you can turn off tracking, for example, or turn on and off eye detection on the press of that button. So not only is it moving the focus point, um, you can actually get a bit more functionality there. That is useful. So for each of these buttons, there is um, a lot of customization. Not every button can do everything, but it's really worth going in. So I like to have the flash um, function settings easily accessible to me, because I like to be able to uh, change the flash power and things very quickly, so I can have that there. It is also possible to set up different things for video, so we can go over to the right-hand side and set up different stuff for the video when you're in video mode. And it is even possible, so the exposure lock button up the top hand right, right hand side, you can go in there and you can have that as autofocus, autofocus start. So if you have back button focus, you can set up back button focus on the AF on and on that uh, exposure lock button. So we have two back button focuses. Why would we do that? We can go in, press info, and set up um, a specific characteristic of the AF. So if I want the exposure lock button AF to be one shot and like a small area, a bit more precise, I can do that. And then on the AF on button, I can have eye detection, whole wide area, so it's just tracking any subject that comes in. There is a lot you can go through in the custom controls menu. And I generally sort of say that this is these cameras are designed to work for everybody out of the box, but how you work will be very different and to get the best out of the camera for you is worth customizing so that you can get the camera to work more efficiently for the type of photography that you do. Below that you can customize the dials, um, so what each dial is doing. And then down the bottom you can clear those customized settings, which I'm going to do now. So custom menu four, um, add cropping information. You can go in here and set a, an aspect ratio of cropping and it will show you lines in the viewfinder. Um, and then in Digital Photo Professional, it'll automatically or very quickly add that cropping in, uh, crop to your images. 
If you're shooting in RAW and bring it into uh, Photoshop, it will ignore that. You can enable or disable audio compression to sort of save space when you're doing video. And below that is the default erase option. What does it do when you hit the erase button? You can customize that. Release shutter without your lens. So if you are using a lens that the camera doesn't recognize, um, particularly really old lenses that don't have a chip in them, um, the camera won't take a picture. So you'll need to go in here and enable uh, without sh uh, release shutter without a lens. Uh, below that is retract lens with um, on power off. So some lenses, when you're shooting, they uh, when they're focusing, they sort of the front element of the lens moves further forwards and backwards. And when you turn the camera off with this setting on, it'll retract the lens uh, back to its sort of closest setting. Um, if you are sort of set up on a tripod with a everything ready to go kind of on a say a stop motion kind of rig, then you wouldn't want the camera to change anything. Uh, in those sort of situations, you want to have this off. And then the final one in the custom menu is clear all custom functions. So this will clear a lot of the changes we made here, but it won't do uh, the customized buttons or the customized dials. So we have to do those individually. And then the final bit here is the My Menu. So if anything I've shown you in that menu system is something you would use regularly and you don't want to have to hunt through the menu system to find it, you can set up My Menu tabs um, and you can name each of those tabs. So I tend to have one for landscape, one for portrait, and then you can set up things that you know you're going to use for those things in each My Menu. Um, it is also possible down the bottom, so menu display, when you hit the menu button, you can have it go straight to my menu instead of the normal menu. And that's it. That is the entire menu system of the new EOS R7 uh, APS-C mirrorless camera from Canon. If you have any questions, um, please leave it in the comments. I will check back and answer anything that is left there every now and again. Thank you very much for watching. I hope that was helpful. Have a lovely summer. Goodbye.